It was about 15th February 2019 when I, although attending a conference at the Harvard Business School, decided to pay a visit to some of my colleagues at the Harvard Medical School. I actually literally stumbled upon a conference and a presentation which changed my perspective on consciousness and degrees of consciousness, or what other people call patients in comas. Hi, I'm Terence Comal. It was a freezing morning when I walked through Boston and got eventually to the Harvard Medical School campus and attended a medical presentation by colleagues within the Harvard Medical School on the ethical discussions around degrees of consciousness and what can and cannot be done. The presenter on that freezing cold morning was Dr. Brian Edlow, who is considered a domain expert at Harvard Medical School and Massachusetts General Hospital. And in attendance was Dr. Joseph Giacino, who is the author of some of the leading evidence in this space. I sat there not knowing what to do, being potentially the only African in the room, and attending my first presentation at Harvard Medical School, it was just a surreal experience. And what followed in the next hour and a half was life-changing in my perspective. The discussion centered around a 21-year-old young man, and without getting into too much personal information, he hadn't been, been involved in a motor vehicle accident. When the doctors showed us the evidence of what the patient looked like, they said his Glasgow coma scale was 4 out of 15, which is inconsistent and in keeping with coma or unconsciousness. When they did his CT scan or CAT scan, the doctor, Brian Edlow, said when he watched as the scan results came through on the screen in front of him, his heart sank because there was significant damage to the entire brain. There was significant damage to the brainstem. There was also on some of the specialized imaging on diffusion weighted imaging and susceptibility weighted imaging showing 18 to 20 different bleeds in different areas of the brain. Diffuse or large masses of damage to the brain tissue or what is known as diffuse axonal injury. He then took us to the process of how the patient was admitted, how he was treated, what they did for the patient and how the opportunities or his window of improving was very small. And I too agreed with that because that's what we were taught in medical school, right? That's what we were led to understand right till very recently that when a patient has such a significant injury, he either is not going to live through it, so his potential to survive is minimal. There's also the risk of if he does survive, he may be in what is known as a permanent vegetative state, or if there's a moderate level of improvement, he may recover with significant functional difficulties. And that is when, in my experience, families are then asked to make a decision. Do you want to turn off the machine or do you want to wait? Commonly, pressure is exerted from the paternalistic or the advisory perspective from the doctors who are saying, well, the opportunities are limited. He is potentially what some term brain dead. But in the presentation, as Dr. Edler went on at, at Harvard Medical School, he then said these were their findings. But they persisted, aggressively using multimodal or different types of assessments, stimuli, as in audio testing, hearing testing. And they took him into what was known as a functional MRI, in which very stimuli are administered to the patient so that he can, they can test if he responds to sound, music, touch, speech and other things that you typically wouldn't get when you normally assess the patient. Because when a doctor assesses a patient and looks for a response, he can't really see whether the brain responds. And when we get a brain scan, commonly they don't test doing any functional assessment. They do what is called a plain MRI or something in which they assess the brain, but with no external stimuli to say, is he responding, is he indeed responding? And when we reached a point in the discussion with some of the most amazing experts in the world sitting in that room, he then said, what do you think would be the outcome for this patient? And I, like the rest of them, started to believe, well, it's one of those three choices. And none of them looked positive for him or his family. He then showed us a picture of a young man graduating summa cum laude in his degree. That young man was exactly that same patient who graduated in a finance-related field. And it was actually quite a, a humorous environment in which he said he currently works in Wall Street. 
he's most likely managing your pension funds. Now, take a step back. And to me, what was discussed was amazingly profound. Because there is a common practice, and I can speak from the Southern African space, is doctors will say, even if a patient is unconscious for a particular period, they draw inferences to say he'll always have a brain problem, particularly in the medical legal space. It's so fundamental because in South Africa, if a patient is unconscious for a limited period, and let me explain to you how that is done. That limited assessment of a Glasgow Coma Scale in which they test visual response, motor response, and speech response is commonly done by a basic life support healthcare practitioner. So somebody who's done usually a six-week training course, the basics of entry-level assessments, that's the first respond on the ground who documents. This is what I found. A specialist neurologist or neurosurgeon who's been practicing for 15 to 20 years, who's been a doctor for 30 years, then bases his entire medical opinion on somebody who's done a six weeks course who may or may not even understand the concept of how to completely do that testing. Based on that, they then hypothesize to the honorable courts, to their law firms and instructing parties, this patient will never make it. He'll never succeed. He'll never mount to anything. He's always going to have a brain problem. And they then start to hypothesize. And in my mind, it almost starts to look like Alice in Wonderland. Because you go down a hole of random speculation because one, just one set of tests said there was some portion of unconsciousness. But Harvard Medical School experts now say this is the finding. The finding is irrelevant of the seriousness of the injury of the brain. There is no 100% certainty on the prognostic value of the current systems in place. What to me was phenomenal is that research done by Dr. Joseph uh, Garciano is his research comes forward. The original research in the space was in 1995 in which the American Academy of Neurology said these are the guidelines for depths of consciousness and assessments of patients commonly known as in a coma. It was then revised in 2002 and briefly mentioned in 2010. In 2018, groundbreaking research, which included multi-center assessments across the United States, supported by national institutes of the United States government, supported by the American uh, College and Trauma Societies, supported by the Pediatric Societies, and the American Academy of Neurology. This groundbreaking research was then presented and published in the International Neurology Journal, it has become the practical update and guideline for the American Academy of Neurology, which is to a large extent one of the most guiding associations in the world, would gives you an inference based on the latest research of saying things need to change. Thank you so much for watching our content and we hope it, you find a great value in the time and effort we're putting into this to share a very complex field of the medical legal world. If you do enjoy our content, we'd really, really appreciate if you subscribe to our channel, clicking on the button below and clicking on the little notification bell right next to that so you don't miss the latest content as soon as it comes out. Again, if you like our content, we'd really appreciate it if you also liked this video. Thank you.